Thank you for joining us today on November 21st, 2023 for a teach-in hosted by the Center for Security, Race and Rights, which is based at Rutgers Law School, Newark campus, also known as the People's Electric Law School. The People's Electric Law School has a proud and long history of uh, bringing to light and providing a platform for the voices of communities, individuals, uh, and organizations that are often marginalized, uh, censored, uh, vulnerable within American society and within the uh, international community. And so it is our distinct pleasure to be hosting this teach-in series on Palestine. Our first one was focused on Gaza, which was which took place on October 16th, 2023. And you can watch it on our YouTube channel for our Center for Security, Race and Rights. This is our second one, which is Palestine 101. The second, the third one will be on December 5th, which will be about the West Bank and Jerusalem. And the fourth one will be on December 8th, which will be about the history and current uh, developments of Israeli settlements in the occupied territories of Palestine. And we have with us uh, the uh, Dr. Zachary Foster, who is a well-known expert on Palestine. He received his PhD from Princeton University, and he has written extensively on the topic as well as uh, posting, uh, excuse me, he's written extensively on the topic, especially in his Palestine in Your Inbox uh, platform, which uh, I encourage you to to join and subscribe to. Now, before we get started with the presentation, I want to encourage everyone, if you do not already follow the Center for Security, Race and Rights on Facebook, on Twitter at RUCSRR, on Instagram at Rutgers CSRR, and to join our newsletter, which you can do so by going to our website at csrr.rutgers.edu. And if you have the means to make a donation, no matter how small or how large, uh, please do so by going to our website, csrr.rutgers.edu and press donate, because we are funded by uh, private donors. And this is what allows us to provide such excellent programming and make it free and available to the public. And my name is Sahar Aziz. I'm a distinguished professor of law at Rutgers Law School, the executive director of the Center for Security, Race and Rights and also the author of the book, The Racial Muslim When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom, which includes a chapter about how the development of the stereotype of the Palestinian terrorist was a precursor and set the foundation for the post 9-11 uh, stereotype of the Muslim terrorist. And we are seeing that on full display in the coverage of Israel's uh, siege and what I believe are genocidal practices in Gaza. And finally, on November 21st, 2023, as of today, uh, credible reports find that there is 17,000 Palestinian civilians that have been killed by Israel. There are 31,000 Palestinian civilians that have been injured by Israeli bombardments and other forms of uh, starvation, dehydration, and destruction of medical practices. There are, of those 17,000 that have been killed, there's an estimated at least 6,000 children. The average age of the Palestinian civilian that is killed, or of the, of the children that are killed is five years old. And the Center for Security, excuse me, the Center for Constitutional Rights has filed a lawsuit, uh, both in the International Criminal Court and also in US Court, alleging that what Israel is doing in Gaza uh, is not only war crimes and violations of human rights, but it is also genocide. And specifically, uh, not just the indiscriminate bombardments that produce disproportionate collective punishment against civilians, but um, perhaps even more lethally over the next few weeks and months is the denial of the entrance of food into Gaza beyond 5% of the needs, if even that, uh, the cutting off of water uh, the destruction systematically of the hospitals and the refusal to provide fuel that is required for the few hospitals left to operate and also for pumping of clean water. So over time, what you will see is hundreds, if not thousands of Palestinians dying from starvation, dehydration, and disease, in addition to injury and uh, being killed by the Israeli military offensive. 
So I think those are just important facts to put forward to understand the urgency of why all of us must understand the history of Palestine that led to the current tragic uh, moment and and uh, deaths of so or, or murder of tens of thousands of Palestinians. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Foster, who will give 60 minute presentation, and then we I will field a Q and A using the Zoom button function. Thank you very much. Welcome, Dr. Foster. Welcome back, and the floor, the virtual floor, is yours. Okay, Sahar, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. And I am going to talk about the history of the Palestine question from its origins in the late 19th century to the present. I'm going to try and do that in 60 minutes. I've got 60 slides, so let's get started. Palestine before Zionism. So Palestine is part of the Ottoman Empire. It is 85% Muslim, 10% Christian, and 5% Jewish. And generally speaking, Palestine's religious communities enjoyed positive relations with one another. You had Muslims accompanying Jews on picnics to the grave of Shimon Tzadik in Sheikh Jarrah. You had Jews celebrating uh, uh, Ramadan together with Muslims. Generally speaking, we're talking about very positive intercommunal relations. They also shared a common Ottoman identity and shared a common loyalty to the Ottoman Empire. Palestine was also the center of international intrigue because of its holy places, and thus it attracted many pilgrims and tourists and missionaries. Palestine's native population spoke primarily Arabic and started to develop an identity around Palestine beginning in the second half of the 19th century. And already by 1870, the, the word Palestinian is in use in English and German. Uh, and already by the 1890s, the word Palestinian, Palestinian in Arabic, is in use by people like Khalil Beda, Salim Kobain, and Najib Nassar, a few of the earliest uh, Palestinians who identify as such. By the first decade and a half of the 20th century, you already have a strong Palestinian identity, as evidenced by this op-ed published on a front page article in the newspaper Palestine, Palestine uh, in 1912. And I'm not going to read this entire paragraph, but you can already get a sense. Oh, Palestine, your history dazzles with marvel. With marvel. Your geographical position is wondrous. You, your varied climate, bananas and dates are cultivated in the Jordan Valley, the best oranges in Jaffa, the pleasant summer nights in the mountaintops. So already um, you have a very strong Palestinian national identity within the first decade and a half of the 20th century. Let's talk about uh, very briefly the origins of Zionism in Europe in the, uh, in the late 19th century. So <clears throat> you have an ideology spreading around Europe in the 19th century called nationalism, which says that nations have a right to their own states. And European Jews who are living in Europe and significantly impacted by these European developments embrace this ideology of nationalism and they combine it with Judaism's preoccupation with the Holy Land and they settle on Zionism. And Zionism is an ideology that says that Jews uh, have political rights in the land of Palestine. It's supported by Christians um, because it solves Europe's quote unquote Jewish problem. Um, you have anti-Semitism is rampant in Europe at the time and Jew and, and Europeans, um, and many of them uh, would rather have uh, uh, would rather see Jews leave Palestine. It also fulfills an eschatological fantasy and as well provides a smokescreen for imperial imperial expansion. Throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, European Christians massacred thousands of Jews in Eastern Europe in attacks known as pogroms, which drives millions of Jews out of Eastern Europe, primarily to uh, the New World, primarily to the United States. Two million settle in the U.S., 30,000 moved to Palestine. And here you see pictured on, on the right, the first Zionist Congress in Basel in Switzerland in 1897. Talking very briefly about different strains, uh, ideological strains within the Zionist movement, you have, um, of course, Zionism is an ideology that that says that there ought to be a, a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. Spiritual Zionists like Achad Ha'am call for a spiritual center in Palestine, focusing on Jewish spiritual regeneration, especially the revival of the Hebrew language. Uh, you have political Zionism, the dominant strain within the Zionist movement, a uh, uh, who, whose primary uh, political uh, um, proponent is Theodor Herzl, calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine, um, owing to the inevitability of Jewish persecution in Europe. And if I had to sort of summarize 
uh, uh, kind of the essence of the Israel-Palestine question from the 1880s to the 19 to 1948. This is kind of how I would uh, summarize um, the next 10 or 15 slides, which is that most Zionist thinkers and leaders ask themselves the same question, which is how is it that we are going to establish a Jewish state in a land that is overwhelmingly non-Jewish, in a land that is overwhelmingly Palestinian Arab? Theodore Herzl asked himself that question. So did Achad Ha'am, Israel Zangwell, and all of the Zionists listed here. Essentially, every important Zionist thinker and leader all asked themselves this question, um, and they settled on different answers. Um, and, and all Palestinian leaders, I would say, asked themselves a different question, which was, what is, what is the appropriate, what is the legitimate, what is the correct way to resist a group of people intent on making all of the important decisions over your life. And Palestinian leaders and thinkers all ask themselves that same question. And of course, they also uh, th there was also a spectrum of responses from the more reconciliatory approaches to the more uh, militant resistant approaches. Already from the late 19th century, so already in the 1880s and 1890s, as Zionists are migrating to Palestine in the thousands, um, violence breaks out between Palestinians and Zionist settlers in Petah Tikva, in Gedera, in the Galilee, in the Jezreel Valley, um, primarily because Palestinians who had been living there for decades, if not centuries, are displaced and uh, um, or their means of livelihood are threatened or usurped by the Zionist settlers. Palestinian intellectuals like Yusuf Dia Khala, Yusuf Dia Pasha Al Khalidi, pictured here uh, on the bottom right, writes a letter to uh, the chief rabbi of France, which gets passed along to Theodore Herzl already in the late 1890s, saying, Leave Palestine in peace. This is going to lead to bloodshed. Uh, many Palestinian Arab newspapers already in the late 19th century, uh, excuse me, already in the early 20th century, are publishing hundreds of articles hostile to Zionism for the same reason. Palestinian Arabs, uh, like Najib Nassar, found organizations in 1911 to buy up land to prevent it from falling into the hands of Jewish uh, settler uh, uh, colonies. Already in the uh, uh, 1910s, you have the Ottoman parliament, which is debating Zionism as well, although the Ottoman state does nothing to stop the influx of Jewish settlers. A, a, a brief word on the native Jewish reaction to Zionism. The native Jews of Palestine on the eve of Zionist immigration are something like 40% le uh, speak Ladino. 40% uh, of them speak Ladino, 40% speak Yiddish as a native language. and uh, uh, But most of those Ladino speakers also speak Arabic as a second language. They're about 50% Ashkenazi, 50% Sephardi, and they live in Jerusalem, Tiberias, Safed, Hebron, and Jaffa. And the native Sephardi community, I would say, grew increasingly closer to the foreign Zionist community from the 1880s onwards. Um, and many prominent Jews, uh, native Jews of Palestine, became prominent Zionist activists. Um, at the same time, I would say many Ashkenazi Jews actually rejected Zionism um, because Zionists were primarily secular, and this secularism represented a threat to the pious Jewish community uh, of Palestine. And so uh, many uh, were actually hostile um, to Zionist land purchases. At the same time, I would say all of the native Jews competed with the new arrivals, the new Zionist arrivals for philanthropic support. So that created another wedge between uh, the two communities. There were many different uh, uh, approaches to the colonization of Palestine. As I suggested earlier, um, there was a more reconciliatory approach, which said we need to build strong and positive relations with the Arab community of Palestine based on the belief that the natives would eventually accept a Jewish homeland in Palestine, owing to the supposed benefits brought uh, to the native population, uh, owing to Zionist investment. Um, there was, a, a, let's say, a middle strand, which wasn't fully reconciliatory, understood the importance of, of building bridges, I would call this the bribery approach, which is that many Zionists in those early decades uh, sought to buy support uh, uh, in the form of bribes to the editors of newspapers like Philistine, like al Nafir, and like Mirat al sharq all of whose editors were offered uh, subventions uh, of, from the Zionist community, a, a, as well as uh, subventions and bribes uh, to Palestinians to issue declarations of support for Zionism. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you had Zionists like Jeb Zabotinsky, uh, who believed that the natives would never accept a foreign takeover of their land. They saw themselves as the indigenous population of the land, and thus the only option for people uh, like Jabotinsky and the revisionist, revisionist Zionists was to colonize Palestine by force, including expulsion. Let's talk about the arrival of the British. Um, the British occupy Palestine during World War One and decide to turn Palestine from an Arab country into a Jewish country. Uh, via the Balfour Declaration, 
In other words, they sought to promote Jewish immigration and Jewish land purchases in Palestine. And they did this in a variety of ways. They uh, changed uh, property laws to make it easier for Zionists to purchase land. They favored Jews over Palestinians in granting industrial concessions, such as the Palestine Electric Corporation. I think five out of the major, uh, out of the six major concessions granted to uh, nat- uh, to the the population of Palestine were granted to Jews rather than Palestinians. The British also prevented the establishment of Palestinian universities and limited Palestinian secondary education to subvert the political awakening of the native uh, Palestinian population. Of course, the Balfour Declaration recognizes the indigenous population only as uh, only their uh, civic rights, but not their political rights, as uh, as was outlined in the Balfour Declaration of 1917. The British rule uh, British rule in Palestine was, of course, a- anti-democratic. It rejected the political will of 85% of the native population uh, of Palestine. In 1919, you have an American commission that shows up to Palestine and surveys the, the, the native uh, uh, people of the land and asks them, do you support a Zionist program? 85% say no. Of course, the, the British ignore the, the, the wishes, the political will of the, of the native population. Meanwhile, the Palestinians hold national congresses every year from 1919 to 1926 and call for a democratic state in Palestine, an independent, an independent state in Palestine whose representatives would be elected by the uh, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim native inhabitants of Palestine rather than be appointed by British uh, imperialists. Um, the British, of course, ignore uh, the Palestinian demands for democracy and for self-rule. This eventually uh, boils over in one of the largest anti-colonial revolts in the entire interwar period in from 1936 to 1939, in which uh, Palestinians r- rise up uh, to resist the colonial imposition, the colonial rule. Um, and it, uh, the British, of course, uh, crack down. And, and either kill, imprison, or exile the overwhelming majority of the Palestinian political leadership. And the revolt made it clear that Jewish immigration and land purchases had led to Palestinian Arab land dispossession and that the Arab public would not tolerate this political uh, sub- subjugation. Let's talk about the Zionist point of view. So uh, from, the, uh, 19, uh, from 1920 to 1930, the Jewish population of Palestine doubles. You can see here a, a chart uh, on the right of the uh, of Jewish immigration to Palestine. Um, and then from 1930 to 1940, the, the, the population, the Jewish population of Palestine increases by sixfold, owing to the rise of anti-Semitism and especially Nazism in Nazi Germany. And that big uptick from roughly from 1933 to 1936, 37, as was a result of the rise of uh, Hitler in Nazi Germany. And Zionists developed many institutions of statehood. Of course, the goal of Zionists already from the late 19th century was to establish a Jewish state in Palestine. Um, and so they established uh, a labor union, a national fund, healthcare system, land administration, etc. They also established paramilitary organizations known as the Haganah, uh, beginning in 1920, which gets professional, more professional over time, including um, as a result and as a result of uh, support, uh, both financial um, and otherwise uh, uh, from the British, beginning in the mid-1930s. This brings us to 1939 and uh, the White Paper of 1939, which limits Jewish immigration to Palestine uh, because the British realized that they can't continue to allow uh, unlimited uh, Zionist immigration. It will continue to result in more revolt and more violence and more bloodshed. Um, as a result, um, they do limit uh, Jewish immigration to 20, 75,000 uh, 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 Zionist immigrants over the course of the next five years. They say that the an independent state should be one in which Arabs and Jews share government in such a way as to ensure the essential interests of, the, of both communities are safeguarded. This gives rise to uh, Jewish terrorism in the 1940s. You have um, Zionist militias, the Lehi Gain, and uh, um, uh, carrying out a uh, Many terrorist attacks, letter bombs, truck bombs, assassinations, the most deadly of which was the attack on the King David Hotel in 1946, which um, resulted in the death of 91 people, um, primarily uh, British officers in that attack. This brings us to the 1948 war, which you could say begins after the UN partition plan of 1947, in which the United the United Nations uh decides to uh, partition Palestine, as you can see here on the right, the teal uh, 
territory going to the Zionists. That's 56% of British mandatory Palestine going to the Zionists, even though they only own 6% of the land and that the gold uh, going to, to, to the Jews, excuse me, uh, the other way around, teal going to the Jewish state, gold going to the Arab state, um, in an attempt to try to uh, partition the land um, in January. Uh, this, of course, immediately leads to the outbreak of fighting. Um, in January, uh, Ben-Gurion states in a meeting that it is desirable uh, to transfer Arabs out of land controlled by the Jews. In April 1948, the Zionist leadership uh, adopts uh, what is known as Plan Dalit, which is basically a blueprint that provides a, a, a military plan and a military justification to Zionist forces on the ground to depopulate Palestine uh, uh, of Palestinians, destroy Palestinian villages, push out Palestinians uh, uh, from land that the Jews hope to control eventually in a Jewish state. And by May 1948, Zionists uh, declare statehood, the state of Israel, which immediately gains recognition from the US, the Soviet Union, and other major powers. Now, I want to talk about in a little bit more detail the 1948 war, both from Palestinian perspectives and from Zionist perspectives. So from the Palestinian perspective, right, you have 20, 30 years of colonial rule, of anti-democratic rule, in which uh, a colonizer is um, funding and supporting uh, the immigration of a group of people who hope to eventually take over the country and subject its indigenous inhabitants to second-class citizenship. Um, the Zionist forces during the war expel something like 750,000 Palestinians from their homes. Many are expelled by force. Many flee on their own but are prevented from returning by force. Um, over the course of the war, Zionists massacre 800 Palestinians in Der Yassin, in Lid, Chisaz, Haifa, Tantura, and elsewhere. They kill 10,000 Palestinians and wound 30,000 Palestinians. In the case of Lid, for example, Zionist forces enter uh this Palestinian town in July 48. After two days of fighting, Zionist forces massacre 100 Palestinians. Corpses pile onto the streets. They expel all of the remaining inhabitants of, of, the, of the city, as well as nearby Ramle. We're talking many tens of thousands of Palestinians forced into a perilous march to Ramallah at the order, at the direct order of Prime Minister uh, David uh, Ben Gurion. Let's talk about the, the 1948 war from the Zionist perspective, known as uh, the Independence uh, War. Zionists in the early year, in the early months of the war, uh, had a fear uh, that their community would 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 face extermination by the Palestinians uh, because they suffered a number of early defeats uh, in the first few months of the war in in December and January 1947-48, and so they saw this war as a, a, a struggle for self preservation. Um, they uh, they were also uh, mass they also experienced a number of massacres. Uh, uh, Palestinians massacred about 250 Jews during the war, including a massacre on the Hadassah convoy that led to 79 uh, uh, Jews Jewish Zionists massacred. The establishment of the state of Israel made it possible for hundreds of thousands of Jews around the world to find refuge and political asylum, um, which of course then created uh, <clears throat> even more refugees, which uh, which then it became a safe haven uh, for them. Let's talk about the years in the immediate aftermath of the 1948 war. So Israel confiscated between four and seven million dunams of Palestinian property. We're talking a massive amount of property uh, that was confiscated from Palestinians, uh, primarily Palestinian refugees. Uh, the, the Palestinians who tried to return to their homes after the war. Um, we're talking many thousands, if not tens of thousands of Palestinians who are attempting to return to their homes after the war to see family, uh, to reclaim property. Uh, to tend to their crops, um, and they are shot. The, the Israeli military adopts a policy of shoot to kill. So between uh, the end of fighting at the end of 1948, uh, for the next two years until roughly 1950, the Israeli military uh, kills more than a thousand unarmed Palestinians who are, attempting, uh, who are attempting to return to their homes after the war. The expulsions, of course, continue after the war. Israeli soldiers compel Palestinians to leave the villages of Rabsiya, Irqit, Bermin, and other places. Um, this is after the fighting ends. Um, in, from 1949 to 1953, Israel expels another 17,000 Bedouins uh, from their homes, in the, primarily in the south uh, of the, uh, the state of Israel, um, uh, uh, because of alleged attacks on Israeli troops. Um, 
The Palestinians in exile find themselves in absolutely abysmal conditions. You have more than 100,000 Palestinians now who are now refugees in Lebanon. They're not allowed to work in the top sectors of the economy. They're not allowed to own property or start businesses or travel freely. You have 200,000 Palestinian refugees who wind up in Gaza, subject to Egyptian military rule uh, for more than a decade and a half, and are severely restricted in their settlement or employment in Egypt. You have 100,000 refugees in Syria. They can join the civil service, own property, and uh, they have more rights in Syria, but they do face a discrimination nevertheless. And then you have uh, more than half a million Palestinian refugees that wind up in the West Bank, which is occupied by Jordan. They are given full Jordanian citizenship, and they fare the best among all of the Palestinian refugees. They are given most of the rank and file jobs in the civil service of the West Bank administration. As a result of the 1948 war and as a result of the Zionist colonization of Palestine, uh, you have many Jews that face retribution uh, in their own home countries in the Arab and Muslim world. I think it's, of course, important to remember that for the two to three centuries prior to the Zionist movement, um, Jews on average do much better under Muslim rule in the Middle East, uh, in North Africa, than they do under Christian rule in Europe. I'm, we're speaking in, in extreme generalities, but I don't think you'll find really any historians uh, who would disagree with that statement. Um, Israel, uh, after the expulsion of 700,000 Palestinians in 48, um, you know, <clears throat> you have many um, Muslims and Arab states that retaliate against Jews and commit pogroms against them. And, for, and thus, from the late 1940s, large numbers of Jews living in the Muslim world and the Arab world are compelled through discriminatory laws or violence to migrate either to Europe. Uh, most of them prefer to go to Europe or the U.S., and many also uh, migrate to Israel, including many Yemeni Jews here seen on the right in Operation Magic Carpet of May 1949. Let's talk about the Palestinians who are uh, left inside the borders of the state of Israel after uh, the guns fell silent in 1948. You have an, a 1950 Israeli law which confiscates something like 75% of the property of these 150,000 uh, Palestinians, most of many of whom are internally displaced, right? They found themselves uh, in a different village or town or city within the borders of the, uh, of the newly created uh, state of Israel. The government of Israel establishes military rule over uh, the Palestinians and the 104 Arab villages and towns um, uh, in this, in the, within the borders of the state of Israel. And this military regime uh, requires Palestinians to obtain permits to even leave their villages, uh, to travel within the state of Israel, to travel from a one Palestinian village to the next Palestinian village, to find jobs uh, in Jewish cities. They need permits. They need uh, permits to harvest their crops. Uh, they uh, their uh, property is oftentimes confiscated when they violate the the laws and when they um, um, Israel also is imposing curfews and checkpoints and detentions and you have historians that talk about how this period from forty eight to sixty six uh, this period of military rule um, uh, within the state of Israel is really the precursor to Israel's uh, imposition of military rule in the Palestinian occupied territories uh, uh, beginning in 67. And it's many of the practices and policies and laws and regulations that are first applied within the borders of the state of Israel to the Palestinian uh, citizens of the state of Israel that then get transferred and applied to the Palestinians in the occupied territories after 1967, including, of course, the permit regime, which uh, I would say really comes to dominate Israeli policy in the occupied territories after 67, which we will get to uh, shortly. Um, within this period, you also have the Kof, uh, Kofar Qasim massacre in which the Israeli military police massacre uh, 48 Palestinian Arab uh, civilians who are returning to work, uh, returning from work during a curfew that they were not told about. Um, now let's also talk about the Palestinians abroad uh, from the 19, uh, late 1940s onward. So I first want to talk briefly about the border wars. So from 1949, as we said, uh, to 1956, you have many uh, thousands, uh, primarily unarmed Palestinians trying to return to their homes. Like I said, reclaim property as refugees so often try to do after a war. Israel slaughters between 2,700 and 5,000 of them uh, from 1949 uh, to 1956, known as the border wars. And then um, Palestinians pick up arms uh, <clears throat> in reaction uh, and start to fight back. And you have many uh, cross-border raids by Palestinians from the West Bank and from Gaza. Uh, during the 1950s, Israel decides in 1956 it wants to root out and, quote-unquote, eradicate Palestinian militant resistance from Gaza. In 56, 
And so it allies with Britain and France in what I would call a neo-colonial war uh, to reoccupy the Suez Canal in 1956. And um, Israel occupies the Gaza Strip for six months from October uh, to March uh, 1957. In the course of its occupation, it enters Khan Yunis on November 3rd, 1956, uh, goes door to door, uh, grabs every single male above the age of 15, lines them up in the city center of Khan Yunis in, on November 3rd, uh, 1956, massacres uh, hundreds of Palestinians. One of the boys who uh, was witness, who bore witness uh, to this massacre uh, was Abdul Aziz Rantisi, who a few decades later was one of the co-founders of Hamas. Meanwhile, uh, Yasser Arafat, by the way, is one of the commandos in these cross-border raids. He's pushed out of, uh, of the Gaza Strip in, uh, in the 1956 Israeli occupation. He winds up in, uh, in the Gulf by 1959 and co-founds, um, together with Abu Iyad, an organization called Fatah, which later becomes Israel's primary uh, adversary um, throughout for the next, call it, four decades. And the goal of this new organization, Fatah, is to liberate Palestine through revolutionary armed struggle. Um, the origins of the organization lie in 48, which forced Palestinians into a state of impoverishment and statelessness and dependence and division. Palestinian revolutionaries describe their struggle as having, quote, a purifying effect on the Palestinian psyche by enabling them to take their fate into their own hands. Um, quote, the Palestinians have no citizenship. They have no history, no rights, no duties, or sense of belonging. The only way to restore those functions was to return to the homeland, says Saeed uh, uh, Khaled al-Hassan. And the only way to do that was through force. Um, by 1964, you have the establishment of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, um, which earned over the course of the next few decades the title of the sole quote the sole legitimate represent uh, representation of the Palestinian people according to the UN. The goal of the PLO was to liberate Palestine through military resistance through force. It, the PLO became this umbrella organization for all these different Palestinian groups: the PFLP, the DFLP, Fatah. Uh, it was also backed by the Arab League and became a kind of Palestinian government in exile, if you will. And that organization is led uh, by Yasser Arafat, uh, really from the 60s until his death in, in 2004. Um, and uh, you, would, you could say that uh, he is voted as PLO president in 69, and he really champions the Palestinian cause on the international stage. They're also, of course, responsible for many terrorist attacks. Um, and eventually, by the late 80s, really by the early 80s, but increasingly by the late 80s, um, the PLO abandons violence. Uh, we'll get to this uh, uh, in the next couple of slides. We talked about the attacks that the PLO launches on Israel, uh, on Israelis abroad, hijacking planes, um, massacres of Israelis at the Olympics. Israel uh, retaliates with uh, disproportionate violence, goes on the offensive, uh, border raids, um, on PLO positions, uh, attacking Lebanese civilians, uh, killing thousands of Palestinians in uh, uh, in Lebanon in 1982 during its invasion, um, <clears throat> kidnapping. Uh, um, you know, we're talking about um, many attacks on Palestinians in Jordan, where they're first based, um, and then of course in Lebanon um, and beyond. Fatah is, of course, the most prominent of these Palestinian militant organizations. Then you have PFLP and DFLP, as we uh, already talked about. In June 1967, Israel um, occupies the West Bank from Jordan. It occupies uh, the Gaza Strip from Egypt. It occupies the Sinai Peninsula, as well as the Golan Heights. In just six days, it annexes, um, it, it occupies all of these territories. In June 67, uh, days after the, the, the guns fell silent, Israel uh, raises the Maghrebi quarter of Jerusalem's old city. Um, with, we're talking within, within days, if not uh, within weeks, if not days of the end of the war, destroying 135 homes, leaving uh, 650 uh, people homeless. It also expels another. Um, so in 48, uh, Israel expels uh, about 750,000 Palestinians from their homes. Uh, that's why it's called the first Nakba, the first catastrophe. You might say the second uh, Nakba, the second catastrophe was in 1967 when Israel expelled another. Uh, between 250,000 uh, to 300,000 uh, Palestinians from their homes, from places uh, like Beit Nuba, Yalo, Imwes, Beit Awa, and other and elsewhere. Um, uh, the 1967 war is another incredibly important turning point in, in the in the, in the Israel-Palestine question because it fractures the Palestinian struggle now even further. 
uh, you have a, a new struggle, uh, the Palestinian struggle within the state of Israel for equal rights. You have the Palestinians now in the in the occupied territories in the West Bank and Gaza, who are now uh, facing a military occupation that grows increasingly brutal over the course of the next few decades, as we shall see in the coming slides. And then you have the Palestinian struggle for liberation in exile, as we talked about on the previous slides, first based in the Gulf, and then uh, first in Egypt, and then the Gulf, and then Jordan, and then Lebanon, and then Tunisia. Let's talk briefly about the Israeli occupation of, of the West Bank and Gaza from 67 uh, to 87. So Israel's underlying economic policy is to prevent Palestinian companies and businesses from competing with Israeli companies via its permit regime. In other words, Palestinians are required permits to do pretty much anything in the occupied Palestinian territories, including conducting business with land or property, installing a water device, performing electrical work. Israel shuts down the major Palestinian banks, freezes their assets, and prevents Palestinians from building capital-intensive uh, businesses and companies. Israel suffocates uh, Palestinian, uh, self-sustaining uh, Palestinian development in the territories um, through its permit regime. Uh, Palestinians are unable to fix, for example, water pipes in Gaza, which by the 1990s lead something like 50% of all piped water uh, in, in, in Gaza City to be lost because Palestinians are unable to repair the pipes because they cannot get the permits, uh, which are denied. Um, there was less land in the occupied territories that was under cultivation uh, in 1987 than there was in 1947. Again, owing to restrictions placed on Palestinian farmers, they were not able to grow certain fruits and vegetables. They were not able to fish in certain parts of the Mediterranean, uh, of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, there are restrictions placed on what uh, Gazan uh, uh, Farmers are allowed to grow. It takes five years, for example, to get a permit to grow a citrus uh, to, to grow citrus trees. So major impediments placed on Palestinian economic development. Um, and the result of this is that Palestinians are forced and pushed into the Israeli labor market and are are thus become dependent on the Israeli labor market uh, for work. This, of course, has absolutely catastrophic consequences uh, for Palestinians in the 1990s. Uh, especially after 1991, when Israel now requires all Palestinians in the occupied territories to obtain an individual permit um, to enter Israel to work. So after having made Palestinians dependent on the Israeli, mark, Israeli labor market for two decades, Israel then um, pulls the rug from underneath the Palestinians. And, uh, and as we shall see in the coming slides, this has disastrous effects on the Palestinian economy. Of course, Israel also um, Im imposes a brutal military occupation. Um, Israel um, Israel kills something like 650 Palestinians from 1967 to 1987. We're talking about something like 32 Palestinians per year are killed every year for 20 years. Um, Israel arrests and deports any Palestinian who resists its rule, be it in, in, in a violent form or in a nonviolent form. Israel frequently and ind indiscriminately detains masses of protesters. Israel rejects every request for Palestinian uh, family reunification uh, between a Palestinian in the occupied territories and Palestinians inside Israel. Israel, of course, bans any political expression. Uh, it is illegal in the occupied Palestinian territories uh, to organize 10 people for a political cause, to wave a Palestinian flag, uh, to make artwork of, of green, red, black, and white. And one Palestinian, Fatih uh, Raban, sits six months in an Israeli prison in 1982 for having painted a painting using these four colors. Israel, of course, censors textbooks and magazines, and by the 1980s shuts down uh, most uh, Palestinian uh, newspapers, or at least uh, imposes such severe censorship on a Palestinian press that uh, it's very difficult to really publish much of anything uh, by the 1980s. The Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories is really also, I mean, there's really one principle that you, if you just understand this one principle, you'll understand the Israeli, um, I would say, land policy in the occupied territories, which is how is it that we get as much land as possible uh, with as few Palestinians on that land as possible? And this really acts as a guiding principle for Israel's land policies, really from 1967 to the present. And so over the course of uh, these uh, um, this 20-year uh, period from 67 to 87, Israel prevents Palestinian development on something like 50% of the land of the West Bank through its policies of... Uh, Military establishing military zones, of establishing uh, Jewish settlements on state lands. It declares land state land, which Palestinians are thus uh, unable to build on. And it also declares land national parks, again, making it impossible for Palestinians to build on that land 
from 67 to 2011, Israel issues zero new permits to drill new wells. Israel places restrictions on the collection of rainwater uh, through cisterns, which you're now seeing posts about in the past day or two. Palestinians are unable to even collect the rainwater without Israeli permits. Palestinian, 180 Palestinian communities in rural areas of the West Bank uh, to this day have no access to running water owing to the permit regime that is imposed on them, uh, making it difficult for them uh, to obtain permits to uh, drill new wells, for example. Israel also passes a law in 1970 allowing Jews to reclaim and return to property once owned by Jews before 1948 in the occupied Palestinian territories. But of course, it does not allow Palestinians uh, to reclaim property once owned by Palestinians in the occupied territories before 1948. Uh, one might therefore describe this law as a racist law. It's a law, for example, that uh, enabled uh, Jews to try to reclaim land in Sheikh Jarrah, leading to the 2021 May 2021 war. Um, let's talk uh, about um, so this kind of um, I think this sort of sets the stage for the outbreak of the first Intifada, the first uprising in 1987, when an Israeli truck driver strikes and kills four Palestinians and wounds and injures many, many dozens more um, in on December 9th, 1987. The next day, Palestinians protest. On the very next day, Israel kills another Palestinian protester, and uh, the protests just spread like wildfire. And over the course of the next six years, from 1987 to 1993, you have um, a leaderless uprising, spontaneous protests. We're talking daily strikes, daily riots, boycotts of Israeli rule, and infamously stone-throwing uh, Palestinian children. Um, and I would say the, the real uh, root cause of this uprising was the 20-year brutal military occupation in which Palestinians face daily humiliation at checkpoints. They face daily intimidation. They taste physical abuse, assaults, land confiscations, uh, home demolitions, uh, dep uh, deportations, and like I said, many, many killings. And so it's together to understand why there's this kind of spontaneous outbreak of protests, uh, primarily nonviolent protests. It's because of this brutal 20-year-long uh, military occupation. And during the first two years of that uprising, uh, from late 1987, uh, actually for the first year, during the first year of the uprising from late 1987 uh, to 1988, uh, in Gaza alone, Israel, Israel slaughters 142 unarmed uh, Palestinian protesters and suffers zero ca casualties in response. And that's because it's a nonviolent revolt uh, primarily. And for the first two years of this uprising, Israel kills, um, uh, excuse me, Israel jails 175,000 Palestinians. At the time, Israel had the highest uh, per capita rate of imprisonment anywhere in the world. Um, it jailed uh, 30,000 Palestinian children. Excuse me, uh, 30,000 Palestinian children needed medical treatment after being beaten uh, by Israeli soldiers. Recall it was uh, Yitzhak Rabin, then Defense Minister of Israel, that ordered Israeli soldiers break the bones of the Palestinian children. And about 20% of those Palestinian kids whose bones were broken were under the age of five years old. I think this had a radicalizing effect on all Palestinian groups, including Hamas, which uh, uh, roughly during the course of the same period, uh, beginning in late 1987 to 1988, transitions from a charity organization to a militant organization as a result of, I think, Israel's brutal um, suppression of this primarily nonviolent uprising, which in which 1,200 Palestinians are killed and about 160 Israelis are killed. The Israeli uh, death toll is almost entirely soldiers. I think 90% of those 160 Israelis are Israeli military personnel, whereas on the Palestinian side, the 1,200 Palestinians killed are overwhelmingly civilians and actually a majority, uh, many, many children as well. Let's try and... Um... Uh, try and pick up the pace here. So in 1970, um, Jordan wages a war on the PLO. They relocate uh, to Lebanon. Then Israel invades Lebanon in 1982, slaughters thousands of Palestinians and Lebanese, besieges Beirut uh, for a period of a month or two. Uh, Israeli forces allow uh, and encourage uh, uh, the Phalangist militia to enter the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps, uh, killing many, many hundreds, if not many thousands of Palestinians in 1982. We talked about how in uh, in 1987, uh, Hamas, which again, prior to 1987, had been an Islamic charity organization focused on education and youth sports and cultural activities, funding health clinics and orphanages. It's an apolitical organization for its first decade and a half. Um, 
Um, it's actually funded and supported by the Israeli government uh, for during the 1980s. But then, um, and even as late as, and then of course by night by August 1988, it adopts a charter uh, calling for the establishment of an Islamic state in all of Palestine. But two months before uh, that charter is adopted, you have uh, uh, Hamas officials um, traveling from Gaza uh, to Tel Aviv to meet with then Defense Minister of Israel Yitzhak Rabin, submitting a, a peace offer to Yitzhak Rabin, in which uh, Mahmoud Zahar. Uh, who is a senior Hamas uh, political leader, um, says if you withdraw from the occupied territories um, and allow Palestinians to name their own representatives without Israeli interference, we are open to peace. Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, the founder of Hamas himself, makes a similar offer, um, uh, suggesting uh, to Israel to acknowledge the Palestinian people's right to self-defense, uh, excuse me, self-determination and the right to return. Uh, and we are open to peace. These uh, peace offers, of course, fall on deaf ears. Israel was not prepared uh, to withdraw from the territories. In fact, over the course of the 1980s, it actually doubled its number, uh, actually from 1982 to 1986. Uh, sorry, from 1982 to 1988. So in the six years before these peace offers uh, were made by Hamas leaders, Israel tripled its settler population. So it was in the process of dramatically intensifying and expanding its control of the territories. It had no intention of withdrawing from the territories. And so these uh, peace offers fell on deaf ears. Let's talk about the Palestinian citizens of Israel um, who from 1940 to the present have been really forbidden, I would say, from owning, technically leasing for 100 years, something uh, like 80 to 90 percent of the land of the state of Israel um, via these admissions committees, which are committees um, that uh, are, uh, decide whether or not a person is allowed to move into one of the many, many hundreds of, of Jewish uh, kibbutzim and, and moshavim and towns and villages around Israel. Um, Palestinian local councils and schools and municipalities receive dramatically less funding per capita than Jewish ones. Um, police are far more likely to use violence against Palestinian protesters than Jewish ones. Um, Palestinian citizens of Israel also face discrimination uh, in the job market. They, on average, 45% uh, of Palestinians live below the poverty line. These are Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, in 1991, the uh, per pupil investment in Arab municipalities was one third that of Jewish municipalities. There's a massive shortage of Arab uh, classrooms uh, throughout the uh, throughout the state of Israel. Um, as we stated on the previous slide, uh, Palestinians face discrimination in buying property. These admissions committees, uh, which are in control, like I said, of eighty to ninety percent of the land uh, within the state of Israel, they systematically reject Arabs uh, from. Uh, admission into these towns and villages and kibbutzim and moshavim based on their, quote, lack of suitability to the social life in a small uh, community. Um, Arabs also, a Palestinian a citizens of Israel, are also two and a half times more likely to die during childbirth um, uh, than Jewish babies. And all, Arabs also uh, face discrimination um, owing uh, to the fact that they do not serve in the Israeli military and thus uh, are discriminated based on that. Now, many jobs in Israel require you to have military service, and so Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel are basically cannot get many, many jobs in Israel because of that. Palestinian citizens also have unequal access to basically, um, if you really look at courts, parliament, media, civil service, you have dramatically fewer Arabs represented in all of these sectors of public life. Um, you also uh, have a huge percentage of the Israeli public that sees the Palestinian citizens of Israel as an inherent security threat. Uh, also as an inherent demographic threat. They are a time bomb, a fifth column, owing to the fact that they have a pulse and that they are Palestinian, their very existence, the fact that they breathe is a problem to Jewish Israelis who see them as a demographic threat. Um, you also have many, many dozens of Palestinian Bedouin communities living in the South who've been living there for many, many centuries, long before uh, Zionism, uh, you have, uh, who are not recognized by the state of Israel and they face constant a forcible transfer. They are not connected to the Israeli electrical grid. There are no Israeli buses that pass through those towns. They're not connected to the Israeli water grid, again, because they are not recognized um, because they're Palestinian. Um, Israel also, um, yeah, as I said, does not provide them with public services, and they face some of the highest high school dropout rates and unemployment rates of any community in the country. Um, this kind of brings us to the Oslo process. In 1988, as I said before, um, 
Yasser Arafat, who has uh, been uh, in control of the PLO for decades. Um, he is now living in Tunisia after having been expelled by uh, the uh, Israeli military from Beirut. Um, in 1988, he recognizes Israel's right to exist within uh, secure and, and recognized boundaries. Um, and he, I think, to better understand the transition of the PLO, you not only have to understand uh, their expulsion uh, from Beirut to Tunisia, so they're on the sidelines. Not only do you have to understand that the action, the resistance to Israeli occupation is now based in the territories, in Gaza and the West Bank, uh, rather than in exile. But you also have to understand that uh, Yasser Arafat made the fateful decision to support Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait in 1991. Thus, he loses support from the Gulf countries, uh, from Saudi, uh, from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. Uh, he also loses the financial support he had from the Soviet Union after its collapse. Um, and so he is now has lost political support. He has lost financial support and he is on the sidelines. And this, I think, help explain why he uh, recognizes Israel uh, in 1988 and eventually and it starts to engage in negotiations with the state of Israel in the late 80, in the late 80s and eventually signs the Oslo Accords with the state of Israel in 1993, in which Israel agrees to recognize the PLO as the official representative of the Palestinian people. Israel agrees to withdraw its troops from Palestinian urban centers, uh, starting with Gaza and Jericho. Israel agrees to now subcontract out um, civilian control in these urban centers to this new organization uh, created called the Palestinian National Authority, or just the Palestinian Authority, known as the PA. So now you have this new organization called the PA, which has control over uh, kind of civilian affairs in Palestinian urban centers in the West Bank and Gaza. They do not have control over the vast majority of the land of the West Bank, which is uh, areas A, B, and C, which Israel retains military control of, um, which is something like 82% of the West Bank. Um, the PLO, after having already abandoned violence in the 80s, uh, has to renounce violence again, which it does. Um, but of course, the major uh, uh, issues, the status of Jerusalem, the Israeli settlements, the borders, the, the Palestinian refugees now numbering in the many millions, all of these issues are, um, uh, are, are going to be negotiated at a later date, no, no later than five years uh, from the signing of the Accords in 1993. Why did the Oslo uh, process fail? Well, if I had to summarize, uh, at least my explanation would be that Israel was both party to the Oslo Accords. It was also the enforcer of the Oslo Accords. So it was both party to the agreement, but it was also the, uh, the country that decided uh, whether or not the parties would live up to their en end of the agreement. And whenever there was had to be a trade-off between Israeli security needs on the one hand and Palestinian human rights, Palestinian democracy, Palestinian development on the other hand, well, guess what? Israel always chose, pretty much always chose its own security needs first, which is why when you had um, many uh, terrorist attacks committed by Palestinian militants throughout the 1990s, which we'll get to in the next slide, Israel's response, Israel's response was disproportionate violence and disproportionate collective punishment. And so from, from during this period of time when, when Israel is supposed to be building trust with the Palestinians, instead it is locking down the Palestinians, um, imposing closures and lockdowns, um, and which had an absolutely catastrophic effect uh, on the Palestinian uh, uh, economy. From uh, 1993 to 1996, the Palestinian GDP per capita reduces by one third. You have um, unemployment in Gaza reaches 70% during periods of peak closure, which is actually higher than, than the unemployment rate uh, after 2007 when Israel opposes its, its, its um, really total blockade. So uh, disastrous consequences for the Palestinians during this period of time when Palestinians uh, and Israelis are supposed to be building trust, they're actually eroding trust. Israel also doubles its settler population uh, from 93 uh, to 2000, from uh, increases the population of Israeli settlers in the West Bank, um, the land that is supposed to eventually go back to the Palestinians, it doubles the number of Israeli settlers from 100,000 to 200,000 and confiscates 40,000 acres of Palestinian land during this time period to build Israeli settlements and more uh, bypass roads um, uh, during the Oslo peace process. I think the other problem with Oslo um, was that it didn't include the Palestinian uh, people in exile. And so you have Edward Said talking already very critically of Oslo uh, from 1994 onwards, um, you know, um, that the Palestinian people in exile were not part of this process. Hamas was not part of the Oslo process. Islamic Jihad was not part of this process. So it left out many Palestinians in exile and many Palestinian uh, groups based on the occupied territories. 
Um, it also was a way for Israel to basically legitimate uh, its control of the occupied territories in that the, the Assal courts didn't require Israel to end its military military occupation of the territories. It basically just provided a new a pretext for continuing its occupation of the occupied territories. And at least that was the perspective of many Palestinian intellectuals like Yasser, uh, like Edward Said. Um, from uh, um, uh, also during this period, it's a period of uh, of, of violence. Um, Hamas uh, is carrying out many attacks on Israeli civilians. Of uh, from 1994 onwards, uh, 180 something Israelis, 185 Israelis are killed during this period. From 94 to 2000, in a series of of attacks, um, Baruch Goldstein uh, murders 29 Palestinian worshippers in the Ibrahimi Mosque in 94, which radicalizes. Uh, I would say, if you really look at Hamas's kind of transition from Islamic charity uh, to militant resistance group, it's really after 94. Uh, after Baruch Goldstein goes into the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron, slaughters 29 Palestinian worshippers, that truly radicalizes them, and you get all these terrorist attacks in the 90s. Yigal Amir, also uh, an Israeli radical a settler, assassinates uh, then Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in 95, really derailing the Oslo process um, in, 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 in the process. U.S. policy all the while, I would say, is about as pro-Israel as uh, it can possibly be. Israel is giving more military aid to Israel than it gives to all other countries combined. Uh, currently, that amount uh, uh, comes out to something like $3.8 billion a year. Um, during the Camp David negotiations, which we'll get to in a minute, the U.S. basically acts as a mouthpiece for Israel, applying pressure on Yasser Arafat and the Palestinians to come closer to the Israeli position on the final status issues. Israel also, uh, excuse me, the U.S. also shields Israel from criticism at the U.N. Um, this brings us to Camp David in 2000, in which Israel and the Palestinians sit down to negotiate the land that Israel had already been uh, uh, taking over over the past 30 years. And Jerusalem, Israel proposes a capital in, in Abu Dis, which is actually outside of Jerusalem. That's not acceptable to the Palestinians who want a capital in Jerusalem. On the borders, Israel decides it's going to retain uh, security control over the, um, over the West Bank, uh, over the Jordan Valley for 20 years into the future after the signing of the agreement. In other words, Israel controls Palestinian states' border with Jordan. That's also unacceptable to the Palestinians. Israel decides uh, that it will also maintain three Palestinian military, excuse me, three Israeli military outposts in the West Bank. Israel would also control the airspace of the West Bank and the groundwater uh, in, in the West Bank. Palestinians would, of course, not get to control the groundwater in the state of Israel. Palestinians, of course, would not get military bases in Israel. Um, on the refugee issue, the Palestinians demanded the right of return. Israel refused to even acknowledge they played a role in creating uh, the Palestinian refugees. And so for all of these reasons, the negotiations collapse. There's just too much distance between the two sides. This leads to the outbreak of the Second Intifada. And um, uh, and over the course of the Second Intifada, uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad slaughter 1,000 Israeli civilians in 138 attacks. This is by far the most deadly period for Israeli civilians um, uh, really up until this point. Um, the Israeli military um, kills at the same time that uh, Palestinians kill 1,000 uh, Israelis. Israel kills 3,000 Palestinians owing to its policy of dis disproportionate violence. We will always impose a disproportionate force on the, on, on the Palestinians that they uh, impose on us. Israel at the same time sets up hundreds of checkpoints denying Palestinian freedom of movement. Uh, Israel constructs a wall, which we'll get to in a minute. Israel uproots hundreds of thousands of Palestinian olive trees and continues to reject every request for Palestinian reunification. Uh, during the period of the Second Intifada, again, Palestinian eco economy uh, suffers unemployment rates hitting 50% in 2002. Israel imposes total lockdown, total siege, town arrests in 2002, um, uh, imposing uh, curfews on the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian population. Um, absolutely decimating. Uh, 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 you know, the World Bank estimates the poverty rate reaches 60% in Gaza in 20, 2002. Israel, at the same time, is uh, basically carving up the West Bank through the 
construction of the wall, 90% of which is built within the West Bank. It's trying to, of course, um, uh, prevent uh, terrorism and at the same time uh, creating um, incredible collective punishment on masses numbers of Palestinians, confiscating a huge amount, basically 10% of the West Bank. It confiscates into Israel, isolating tens of thousands of Palestinians um, who fall on the wrong side of the wall and whose lives are thus kind of made miserable as a result. Um, I'm going to try and move a bit faster just because I know we're running out of time. Uh, you have many uh, dozens of Palestinians who um, um, uh, who protest, uh, who, many, many th tens of thousands of Palestinians throughout the 2000s who are organizing these weekly protests against the wall, nonviolent protests in 2003 in Budrus, uh, in Nabi Saleh, in Beit Sira, in Bilain, in Al Ain. Um, Palestinians engaging in nonviolent resistance, and many, many uh, dozens uh, are, are slaughtered as a result, uh, including uh, Bassem Abu Rahma, who is killed by uh, the Israeli military uh, for having protested the confiscation of his own village's land. Um, let's keep moving. So um, you also, from 1967 to uh, the present, Israel uh, has embraced a policy of demolishing Palestinian homes, uh, both, uh, uh, you know, especially in certain areas like Jerusalem, where it wants to push Palestinians out to preserve a Jewish demographic majority of Jerusalem. It, it demolishes homes in the South Hebron Hills, which it wants to control. It, it demolishes homes of Palestinians in the Jordan Valley and the E1 zone. Um, basically, wherever Israel wants to maintain permanent uh, military control, which is the vast majority of the land between the river and the sea, it is constantly demolishing Palestinian homes um, and displacing Palestinians. Um, Israel also uses its policy of work permits in the occupied territories uh, to in ensure Palestinian compliance with Israeli military rule. For example, in Beit Sira, 78% uh, of the workers, uh, of people in Beit Sira work in Israel. And when they started protesting, the, the construction of the wall that confiscated village lands, Israel pulled the work permits from the people of the village, and as a result, they stopped protesting. So Israel uses its policy of work permits um, to control Palestinian political activity in the West Bank. Um, Israel has, over the court, from 1967 to the present, has constructed more than 200 settlements, all of which are illegal according to international law because it's illegal to transfer a civilian population onto occupied territory. Israel has constructed hundreds, uh, um, basically, of these non contiguous little islands that Israel can impose military checkpoints on and lock Palestinians uh, into their villages, preventing them from leaving. In recent years, settler violence has intensified. Uh, more than 900 documented attacks by settlers against Palestinians in 2021 alone. And there's total impunity for the, uh, the settlers who carry out these acts of violence against Palestinians. Over the past few years, there's also been a dramatic increase in forcible transfers, i.e. ethnic cleansing. So you have Palestinians who have been ethnically cleansed from Khirbet Humsa in 2020, uh, from Ras Atin in 2022, and even in just the months immediately leading up to October 7th, you have Palestinians who are being uh, depopulated, who are being ethnically cleansed from Ain Samia and El Kabun in May and August 2023. Israel annexes East Jerusalem in, in 67, as we already stated, and its goal in East Jerusalem is basically to preserve a Jewish majority. Um, and, and that's a problem because Palestinians have always been like 30, 35, 40 percent of the population. And so it's embraced all these policies to um, strip the Palestinian uh, permanent residency status of the Palestinians of East Jerusalem. Something like 15,000 of them have been stripped of their right to live in East Jerusalem in what Human Rights Watch calls a policy and what amounts to a policy of forcible transfer. Um, Palestinians in, in East Jerusalem are rarely granted permits uh, to construct homes, um, again, owing to Israel's desire to preserve this Jewish supermajority in, uh, in Jerusalem. This kind of brings us to um, uh, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas's rise to power in Gaza. And during the second intifada, the PA gives a green light to Hamas and other militant groups to carry out many attacks. Um, the PA often restricts Palestinians from free assembly. And I think over the past decade and a half, the Palestinian Authority has really come to be seen as part of Israel's military occupation of the West Bank, rather than representing some kind of uh, resistance to it. The PA arbitrarily arrests 
uh, arbitrarily arrested uh, 200 Palestinians in 2022. It brutally sl- uh, killed Nizar Banat, a uh, Palestinian activist who, re- who rejected Palestinian Authority rule. So PA is, a, I, I would say, um, a brutal um, uh, organization that I would say it's actually helping Israel maintain its control and maintain its military control of the West Bank. Um, Hamas uh, grew in popularity in the 90s owing to its charity work. It took power in the Gaza Strip beginning in 2007 and has ruled that territory ever since. I'm going to move a bit quicker because I am running out of time. Um, Israel uh, withdraws its uh, settlers from Gaza in 2005, but of course, it continues to militarily occupy Gaza uh, even long after it took uh, it removed its settlers because it maintains control of the borders of Gaza. It maintains control of the maritime coastland. Uh, as we all know now, it, it has long maintained control of what enters Gaza, what exits Gaza. So it controls uh, the water that uh, goes into Gaza, the food that goes into Gaza, electricity, telecommunications, population registry. And for all those reasons, uh, International human rights organizations have long considered Gaza to be under Israeli military rule um, from 67 to the present, notwithstanding the withdrawal of Israeli uh, settlements from that territory in 2005. After Hamas took power in June 19, uh, 2007, Israel imposed a land, air, and sea blockade that, as you all know, probably by now, has had an absolutely devastating effect um, on the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip for more than 16 years, it has led 80%, we're talking four out of every five households, cannot survive without food aid, without handouts from international aid organizations. 90% of the water in Gaza is undrinkable, it's unsafe. Um, Gaza does not have enough electricity. 50% of the people in Gaza uh, lack enough electricity. 50% of the people of Gaza also have had over the past two years to forego healthcare and forego paying electricity bills just to put enough food on the table. And that was the case prior, of course, to October 7th. Um, Hamas's rule in Gaza has been undemocratic. There have been no uh, free and fair elections in Gaza since 2007. Um, Hamas regularly carries out arbitrary arrests of regime critics. Um, and um, there have been uh, Hamas's leader has have also encouraged Palestinians to attack Israeli civilians. Um, it, you know, and Hamas has also carried out many attacks on Israeli civilians from 2007 to the to the present. Um, in 2018. The people of Gaza, in, 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 in many tens of thousands of them, have been protesting at the border, basically from March 2018 until May 2018. Many tens of thousands of Palestinians descended to the uh, wall separating Israel and Gaza, demanding the right of return, protesting the siege and the blockade on Gaza that has had catastrophic humanitarian consequences. In response, uh, the Israeli military uh, slaughtered 223 Palestinians and uh, led to 6,000 uh, uh, life-changing wounds. Um, not a single Israeli experienced any major physical harm during the course of those protests. From 2021 to the present, you've had um, Palestinians pick up arms in the West Bank, in the uh, in Nablus and Janine as a result of the uh, radicalization of the Israeli expansion of its military occupation um, in the West Bank, which has led to 18 people in Israel to be killed, and has also, over the past year and a half, uh, led to many, many uh, hundreds of Israeli uh, uh, Palestinian deaths. The most violent year uh, from uh, 2005, after the Second Intifada, to the present was 2021. And then 20, 2022 was even more violent than 2021. And of course, 2023 has been even more violent uh, than 2023. So 2023, I would say, has really just been a, a kind of an apex, a kind of a you know a peak in violence, but just represents the intensification of violence that has been building for many, many years now. Um, of course, over the past 16 years, Israel waged five wars on Gaza, in total killing 3,500 Palestinians in Gaza, wounding 15,000 Palestinians. In response, Hamas and other groups in Gaza killed 185 Israelis. Um, the conclusion of the humanitarian uh, rights organizations like the UN, like Human Rights Watch, like Amnesty, has been that Israel committed war crimes, apparent war crimes, in every single war it has waged on Gaza. For example, in the 2008 war, uh, it killed more than 1,000 Palestinian civilians. And the Goldstone Report found that in 90% of the attacks that led to the death of Palestinian civilians in Gaza, 
there was no identifiable military target. In other words, they concluded that the goal of the 2008 operation uh, was to terrorize the civilian population of Gaza. Similar conclusions were, were found in 2014, uh, and, and where when Israel killed 1,500 uh, Palestinian civilians, and then in 2021 again, when Israel killed another 150 Palestinians. And during the course of these five wars, Hamas and Islamic Jihad have also carried out apparent war crimes owing to their indiscriminate attacks on Israeli civilian population centers. Just one or two more slides. I'm going to wrap up very, very soon. Beginning in 2020, many human rights organizations began to publish reports describing Israel as practicing apartheid or a a as uh, itself be being an apartheid state. And I think the main reason this began to happen uh, only in the past few years is because for many decades, um, it was believed that Israel would eventually withdraw um, from the occupied territories. Certainly the Oslo process gave many people hope that that would happen. But 25 years later, here we are, the Oslo process is dead. Um, no one, I think, no serious commentators believe that Israel has any intention um, of withdrawing from the, the territories um, uh, that it has controlled over for 75% of the country's existence. And in fact, Israel's control over these territories has only accelerated. Its settlement expansion has accelerated. Its policies of uh, depopulating Palestinian villages in the West Bank has accelerated. Um, and so that has led many people to conclude that if these territories are now a permanent part of Israel, um, and Israel is operating two regimes in these territories, uh, a, a, civil, a civil legal system for the Israeli settlers that live in the West Bank and a military legal system for the Palestinians that li live in, in the, the West Bank. Thus, it is obviously an apartheid regime, which is why every major human rights organization has come to that conclusion um, over the past um, few years. And I think I'm going to end on this slide uh, because I know I'm probably going over uh, my time limit. So um, thank you all very much. I will end my screen share. Um, and I think we're going to pass it back to uh, Dr. Aziz, who's going to moderate the Q&A. Uh, uh, Professor Aziz, I think you're still muted. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Foster. As usual, very informative um, and I think relatively objective. And this is a difficult topic to discuss uh, objectively because um, every it, it's 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 tense. Everybody has a different narrative of what happened and what um, the history that they believe is accurate. And for that reason, it's important that those of us who are learning about this issue, whether we're people who have been researching or studying it for a long time, or people that are new to the topic, is to always read and uh, listen to the different perspectives and, and ask you know, who is speaking and how qualified they are and what their expertise is. And for that reason, we're really fortunate to have you um, present this, Dr. Foster. And I will, before I open up to the Q&A, I will encourage uh, our listeners to go to csrr.rutgers.edu and click on academic resources and go to the transnational rights and security heading and you will find a bibliography on books about Palestine in the English language uh, and that is a resource I've also put it in the in the chat. Uh, the second resource I would encourage you read is a report that a groundbreaking report that the Center for Security Race and Rights just published called presumptively anti-Semitic, colon, Islamophobic tropes in the Palestine-Israel discourse. And the reason we had actually been working on this report for over a year, it, it was not uh, prompted by uh, the Hamas attacks on October 7th uh, in Israel that killed 830 plus civilians and approximately 350 uh, Israeli soldiers or uh, police and have also resulted in 240 hostages, some of whom have been released and some of whom have been killed by Israeli bombardments, according to some news sources. But uh, that is to say that even long before that, uh, one of the challenges in addressing and discussing and debating and talking about Palestine in the United States is that oftentimes uh, criticism of a nation state specifically Israel in this case, or criticism of a political ideology, in this case, Zionism, has um, incorrectly been conflated with anti-Semitism. And as we state in the report, you know, an analogous uh, specious argument would be that if someone were to criticize Saudi Arabia or criticize Iran or criticize um, 
Afghanistan and the, the entities or groups or organizations that are controlling uh, those countries, that that is somehow, that that would be uh, Islamophobia, that that would be a criticism against all Muslims and Islam. And I, and I think we know that that is certainly not the case. So I do encourage you to read that report, presumptively anti-Semitic Islamophobic tropes in the Palestine-Israel discourse. And now I will uh, field some questions that we have for Thank you so much, Dr. Foster, for lending your expertise and your time and providing us with such a thorough and in-depth presentation on a topic that requires an entire semester and in your case, a, a PhD program, a PhD degree uh, to, to really understand. Um, but hopefully this brought our audience and our, our stakeholders and our followers closer to at least comprehending some of the key facts and hopefully inspires them to read more. And I recommend that everybody go to csrr.rutgers.edu to download the bibliography on Palestine that we created. It is available under academic resources under the transnational rights and security uh, tab. And also I encourage you to read our new report, presumptively anti-Semitic colon Islamophobic tropes in the Palestine discourse as a means of at least understanding why we should not be censoring speech, why we should not be uh, limiting debates, and why we should not be weaponizing anti-Semitism or Islamophobia in, uh, in, for the purpose of censorship, that we have got to be engaged in critical debates, that we need to be heated but civil and, of course, nonviolent, where we may not agree, but we're focused more on the facts and we're focused on the evidence and, and really trying to understand the complexity of these issues and appreciate uh, the political bias that exists, and there is plenty of evidence to show that, within the United States, which then imposes a burden on all of us to have to do our own research because we are not getting uh, a two-sided two perspective, a two-sided analysis, or uh, an objective uh, narrative when it comes to Palestine, Israel, and especially when we're talking about the current um, siege and, and genocidal practices going on right now in uh, Gaza by the state of Israel and with the funding of the United States, unfortunately. So with that, I wanna thank you very much. Please attend our next uh, teach-in on December 5th at 12 o'clock where Dr. Foster will be addressing the West Bank and Jerusalem, the history and the current situation. Thank you very much, everyone. and. Massa